The idea for a canal across Panama dates back to the 16th century. In 1513, Spanish explorer Vasco Nunez de Balbo became the first European to discover that the Isthmus of Panama was just a slim land bridge separating the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. Balboa's discovery sparked a search for a natural waterway linking the two oceans. In 1534, after no such passage across the Isthmus had been found, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, ordered a survey to determine if one could be built. But the surveyors eventually decided that construction of a ship canal was impossible. 2. The men behind the Suez Canal and Eiffel Tower were convicted in connection with failed effort to build a canal. A Panamanian canal wasn't really discussed until the 1880s. Ferdinand de Lesseps, a former diplomat who built Egypt's Suez Canal, led a French corporation that dug a Panama Canal in 1881. Poor planning, engineering errors, and tropical diseases killed thousands of workers. De Lesseps wanted to create the canal at sea level without locks like the Suez Canal, but excavation was harder than expected. The De Lesseps-led firm engaged Gustav Eiffel to build Cano locks, but the company went bankrupt in 1889. The French had invested $260 million in the canal project and removed 70 million cubic yards of dirt. France was scandalized by the canal failure. De Lesseps, his son Charles, Eiffel, and other officials were charged for fraud and mismanagement. The men were convicted, imprisoned, and fined in 1893. After the incident, Eiffel resigned and focused on scientific study. Ferdinand de Lesseps died in 1894. The same year, a new French company was founded to take over the assets of the insolvent enterprise and complete the canal, but it too failed. 3. America originally wanted to build a canal in Nicaragua, not Panama. In the 1800s, the U.S. wanted an Atlantic Pacific Canal for economic and military reasons and regarded Nicaragua a better position than Panama. Philip John Bruno Varilla, a French engineer who worked on both canal projects, changed that attitude. In the late 1890s, Bruno Varilla persuaded American lawmakers to buy the French canal buildings in Panama, arguing that Nicaragua's volcanoes made Panama safer. Congress bought French properties in 1902. However, the following year, when Colombia, which Panama was then a part of, refused to ratify an agreement allowing the U.S. to build a canal, the Panamanians, with Buno Varilla's encouragement and Roosevelt's tacit approval, revolted against Colombia and declared Panama's independence. After that, U.S. Secretary of State John Haney and Buno Varilla, representing Panama's provisional government, negotiated the hay buno Varilla Treaty, which gave America the right to build a canal in a 500-square-mile zone that the Americans would control forever. The U.S. spent $375 million to build the canal, including $10 million to Panama to fulfill the 1903 pact and $40 million to buy French assets. 4. More than 25,000 workers died during the canal's construction. The canal builders had to contend with a variety of obstacles, including challenging terrain, hot, humid weather, heavy rainfall, and rampant tropical diseases. The earlier French attempts had led to the deaths of more than 20,000 workers, and America's efforts fared little better. Between 1904 and 1913, some 5,600 workers died due to disease or accidents. Many of these earlier deaths had been caused by yellow fever and malaria diseases that the medical community at the time believed were caused by bad air and dirty conditions. By the early 20th century, however, medical experts better understood the role of mosquitoes as carriers for these diseases, allowing them to significantly reduce the number of deaths among canal workers, thanks to a host of sanitation measures that included draining areas with standing water, removing possible insect breeding grounds, and installing window screens in buildings. Five. Between 13,000 and 14,000 ships use the canal every year. American ships use the canal the most, followed by those from China, Chile, Japan, Colombia, and South Korea. Every vessel that transits the canal must pay a toll based on its size and cargo volume. Tolls for the largest ships can run about $450,000. The smallest toll ever paid was 36 cents, plunked down in 1928 by American adventurer Richard Halliburton 
who swam the canal. Today, some $1.8 billion in tolls are collected annually. On average, it takes a ship 8 to 10 hours to pass through the canal. While moving through it, a system of locks raises each ship 85 feet above sea level. Ship captains aren't allowed to transit the canal on their own. Instead, a specially trained canal pilot takes navigational control of each vessel to guide it through the waterway. In 2010, the one millionth vessel crossed the canal since it first opened in 1914. 6. The United States transferred control of the canal to Panama in 1999. After the canal opened, America and Panama fought over control of the canal and canal zone. After being barred from flying their flag alongside the U.S. flag in the canal zone, Panamanians rioted in 1964. Panama suspended U.S.-Panama relations after the unrest. President Jimmy Carter and Panamanian General Omar Torrijos signed treaties in 1977 that ceded management of the canal to Panama in 1999 but allowed the U.S. to employ military force to protect its neutrality. In 1978, the U.S. Senate narrowly adopted the Torrijos-Carter treaties over resistance from politicians who didn't want to cede canal control. Since December 1999, Panama has managed the canal peacefully. 7. The canal was recently expanded to handle today's megaships. In 2007, work began on a $5.25 billion expansion project that enabled the canal to handle post-Panamax ships, that is, those exceeding the dimensions of so-called Panamax vessels, built to fit through the canal, whose locks are 110 feet wide and 1,000 feet long. The expanded canal, which was completed in 2016, can handle cargo vessels carrying 14,000 20-foot containers, nearly three times the amount previously accommodated. The expansion project also includes a new larger set of locks and the widening and deepening of existing navigational channels. However, while the new locks are able to fit many modern ships, they still aren't supersized enough for some vessels, such as Maersk's Triple E-class ships, the planet's biggest container ships, which measure 194 feet wide and 1,312 feet long, with a capacity of 18,020-foot containers.